How deep is the betrayal of Jesus? That's what we're going to find out today in John 18. Well, you can't always schedule podcasting. And now I went to a conference and I got COVID and my voice is all screwy. The funny thing is, is that when I get sick, my voice goes from this to Kathleen Turner, to Sean Connery, to Darth Vader. So this could be an exciting couple of weeks of podcasting. We're going to talk about John 18. We are coming towards the end of John. Remember, we're summarizing the I am's that John talks about and the signs and miracles. John is talking about the fulfillment of things from the beginning of time. Jesus was there at the beginning, that the plan for our rescue was there from the beginning. And now we're going to see the plan come to fruition. We've been spending a very long time in the upper room. Like I said, it was funny. At one point, Jesus says, well, go get your stuff. We're leaving. And then the lessons continued on for two more chapters. I sort of imagine them standing there, tapping their feet with all their bags and backpacks on. Well, they probably weren't tapping their feet. They're learning at the feet of their Lord. But he wanted to make sure before he left them, they were fully equipped for what's going to come next. And their start of the church, everything started because of what Jesus did, and then the actions of the apostles, and then the believers took after Jesus died. So it says that when he spoke all these words, he went out across the brook of Kidron. So I talked about the Kidron Valley at the very bottom. There was a river. I don't think there was a river when I was there, but I was also there in high summer. And so things dried out in summer that filled up a little bit in wintertime when there was more moisture. So this was the brook of Kidron, where there was a garden. And so they entered in. Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place too. And so Jesus often met there with his disciples. Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some of the officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So this even gets worse. You know, before it was like this ragtag group of people coming to get Jesus. Then you find out it was armed people from different gospels that came to get Jesus. And now Judas procured them. He probably paid for them. He probably paid for them to come. Wow, that is so much worse, right? And so then Jesus, knowing what was coming next, you know, asked him, who do you see? Who are you looking for? And they said, oh, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. This is another one of the I am's. People feel that that he was embedded later, that it was translations who thought, well, the sentence is weird if he just says, I am. So they put a he on there to make the sentence more palatable in English, but it it was just I am. It is the same word in Greek that we get the word ego from. It is a reference to Jesus being God and being the same God who met Moses on the mountain. And then Jesus, who betrayed them, was standing with them. It says they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, these soldiers, there were two kinds of soldiers. Well, there are probably a lot of kinds of soldiers, but there were Roman soldiers for sure. But there were also Herod's soldiers. And those Herod's soldiers are going to be a mishmash of some people that had just got paid. Some of them may be Jewish. Some of them may be Greek. Some of them may be anything. So whatever, when Jesus said this, they knew what he meant. And it said they stumbled back and fell to the ground. And so then he asked him again, well, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you, I am he. If you seek me, let these men go. I, you know, my disciples, let them go. You, you, your fight is with me. And so this was to fulfill the word. Those you gave me, I haven't lost one. Then Simon, having a sword, see, now I told you in the past gospels, Simon was going to get outed, and here he is getting outed. He drew the sword and cut off the high priest's servant's Malchus ear, right ear. And so Jesus said, put the sword back. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me? This has been set in place since the beginning of time, the beginning of time. And you think with a sword and an ear, you're going to end the thing I'm going to do for all mankind? Really? The other gospel said that Jesus put the ear back, oh, saving this poor man, Malchus, and Peter from being a criminal for slicing off the ear of a man. Someone said, 
that Jesus buried the evidence. So Jesus then faces Annas Caiaphas. I think I said that Caiaphas was the older man and Annas was the younger man. It's the other way around. Annas was probably an ex-leader of the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas, the younger man, and Annas was his father-in-law. So this was being handed down through family, essentially. And so he was the high priest that year. And Caiaphas, who advised the Jews, said that this should be a good deal if we could just put Jesus down. Remember, we were saying that one man's death for saving our people of Israel. In fact, I had a prophecy that this death is going to bring back together the people of Israel. This is worth it. Now we have, I think, one of the saddest stories of the Gospels, and we've seen this talked about in other Gospels, is that disciple was known to the high priest. He entered the courtyard, so he's like following where Jesus got taken because he wants to see what happens. You can kind of imagine a guy like Peter's like, I'm going to bust him out of there. I'm going to get him. We're going to rescue him, you know, so he was following close behind. It says a servant girl who watched at the door brought Peter in. And the servant girl said to Peter, aren't you one of the disciples? I'm not. Inside, the servants and the officers, it said, made a fire. And they were standing there warming themselves. So Peter was like, dum de dum de dum And he was standing there and warming himself too. We'll get back to the story in a minute. So then the high priest starts questioning Jesus. And he says, I've openly about this world. I've taught in the synagogues and in the temple for all the Jews who come together, I've said nothing in secret. This isn't a conspiracy. Why do you keep asking me? You heard this said before. That's when Jesus gets struck and it says with his hand, they said this is not just like a slap, but this is like a more like a ramming of your hand into someone. And then someone says, well, that's not how you talk to the high priest. Some other gospels said, well, why don't you prophesy who it was that slugged you? You know. My stuff, right? And Jesus said, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong thing. But if it's right, why do you strike me? That's the whole point, I think. And that's, I think, when I was Jewish, that struck me the most is that I would ask my grandmother and I would ask people in Israel and I asked people who were rabbis here, you know, around me, was Jesus wrong when he gave these prophecies, when he said these things, when they talked about Isaiah? Now, my grandmother, who was a very uh, liberal Jew, she would say, oh, well, no Messiah. There's no person Messiah. These things aren't going to happen to a person. When I was in Jerusalem, I bought a book that talked about what people believed the Messiah to be at the time of Jesus. That's what I really wanted to know. Why didn't they just say, look, you're dumb. That's not what any of this meant. You're pulling in this passage here and there, and it doesn't mean any of that. Because that's what we say now oh, that prophecy wasn't about Jesus. Isaiah was about a young prince who existed at that time. They never said that. So I wanted to know exactly what did people from early in the ADs, what did people believe about the Messiah? And he wasn't wrong. They never said what he said was wrong. They never challenged him. Like rabbis love to debate. The first thing they would have done is say, well, though, according to Akiva chapter four, verse three, I'm making up Akiva chapters, it says this and that. And so Jesus is wrong. They weren't saying that. They were mad that he was answering correctly. He was this uneducated man from Hicktown, and he was telling them stuff that they should have known, but they did know. They knew it, and they don't want to be removed from power. In fact, I asked people in Jerusalem what it is that people thought was the Messiah at that time. And there was a Jewish man that was living not too far from the basilica I was staying at. And I said, do we know that this is what we expected, that there would be a Messiah of God, the Son of God, to be a man? And he says, let me show you a little bit of Jewish mysticism. And I know this is going to be offensive to anyone who is Jewish, but He goes and he draws the letters of Yahweh, which is not something you're supposed to do. And he arranges them up to down. He says it makes the shape of a man. Yahweh was always going to be not just God in spirit, taking the shape of mankind. I don't know what to make of it. I still don't know what to make of it. I know nothing about this topic. 
but when he showed it to me, drawn out that way, as compared to being drawn out right to left like it would have been written, suddenly my little brain went, whoa. Still not believing in Jesus, but my mind was just blown away by that. So it said, the high priest questioned, then questioned Jesus. And then at the end, it says, Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. I think they're both high priests because, like I said, they were in succession to each other. So Peter denies Jesus again. So Peter's standing there warming himself. And then they said, hey, aren't you one of them? No, nope, I'm not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man, he cut off his ear because you're never going to forget a thing like that, right? I saw you in the garden with him, a.k.a. you sliced off my cousin's ear. And Peter's like, no, that wasn't me. And then the rooster crows. It's one of the most humiliating things. This isn't Peter changing his faith. He still believes in Jesus. This isn't Peter, oh, I don't know, doing what Judas did. He lost courage. Like I said, it is so easy, and I think so too. If someone were to come up to me and say, deny your faith or I'll kill you, I'm going to stand up for my faith. What happens when you're standing in a courtyard full of soldiers and they just arrested your teacher? Peter was just saying this many chapters ago, no, I'm willing to die with you. Easier said than done, for sure. And we know that this led to Peter bitterly weeping. That is not even just like, oh man, I'm so weak. This is like sobbing to your core. Jesus went to Pilate. It said the governor's headquarters, which is where Herod used to stay. So Caiaphas doesn't get the good spot in the old city of Jerusalem. He gets something else. And in the early morning, they did this as fast as humanly possible. And the Romans were kind of known for getting up early because, you know, they had that whole stoic thing where people get up early. Probably true. And so then Pilate goes out to see him and says, you know, what what are you accusing him of? And they said, well, if he wasn't doing evil, we wouldn't have brought him here. So, of course, he was doing evil. Well, then take him yourself and do things of your own law. Well, we can't put people to death. You put him to death. So it wasn't even like they wanted him punished. They wanted him dead. And it said that this was to fulfill the word that Jesus spoke to show what kind of death he was going to have. Sometimes, you know, they would stone people and, oops, you accidentally died. Sorry, this was going to be a big death. Well, it doesn't want anything to do with this. Like I said in past Gospels, I don't think he cared, but his job was just to keep the peace. And so I'm sure he knew that the temple structure was not all that popular either. So if he puts Jesus to death, the people could rise up. If he doesn't do it, other people will rise up. I'll look weak. And he is married to the granddaughter of Caesar. So he's a political appointment. And again, you don't get to the backwaters of Jerusalem by being high up in Caesar's estimation. So he's trying to rise up by doing a great job in Jerusalem. Or otherwise, if he doesn't do a great job here, you might never hear from him. And in fact, we didn't hear of him again, I don't think. So this was his shot. This was his chance to run something and then do a good job. So Pilate, while not caring, had to keep a balance. He couldn't have an uprising. He couldn't make this a mess. Because think about, so I just bought a new book and I'm going to read about this soon. But how do you have an empire? You can't leave large groups of troops everywhere, right? So they crossed into Greece and then they started crossing over west into Europe and eventually Britain and then North Africa and even places even farther east than Jerusalem, you always have to leave a contingency and a government there in place. You need to spread this thin because if you have to have so many troops, eventually you get outnumbered. And eventually what they did is they ended up recruiting from barbarians and then were eventually overthrown by those same barbarians. Hey, I'm really into biblical truth, but don't don't catch me on the Roman history, but I think that's how it goes. So they have to have what they have there, keep the violence down, and at least be a fair judge in the situation. I don't think it's that Pilate cared to be a fantastic judge, although it seems like he listened a bit. But he can't be so unfair that we're going to have a rebellion. So Pilate, you know, goes into his headquarters and he goes, well, are you the king of the Jews? Keep in mind, Pilate only cares about political power. 
are you trying to say you're in charge of this land, that this Herod office that I'm sitting in right now belongs to you? And Jesus says, do you say this because of what you think or because what others have said? And Pilate says, look, am I a Jew? I don't know any of this. This is your nation. Your priest brought you to me. What did you do? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting, right? This would be an uprising. We'd be at war right now because you've taken me captive. My kingdom, not of this world. And so Pilate says, so you are a king. And Jesus says, you say that I'm king. Or, you know, in the other gospels, you've said so. And for this purpose, I was born. And I came to this world to bear witness to truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate says, what is truth? And you wonder why I like that line so much is because isn't that what our entire world says? Someone said that Pilate was the first postmodern. If you say, look, the Bible is true. And then someone comes up to you and says, yeah, but what's truth, man? We don't, you know, I said it kind of in a 70s way, but what's truth? There is no truth. And and it's not like Jesus answered or Pilate waited for an answer. It says he went back outside and told the Jews, I, I don't see that this guy is guilty. You have a custom that you should release a man on Passover. So he's hoping, I think, because he's one and maybe intrigued by Jesus a little bit because he's hoping that this man, Jesus, pleads for his life. Just tell me something that I could get you out of there because I don't think he really wanted to kill him. Plus, we know that his wife warned him not to have anything to do with the death of this man. Was she a believer or did she just have a dream? So he goes back in and says, look, I'm going to let someone go because it's Passover. That's my tradition. And they said, no, 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 we don't want him released. Release Barabbas, which again is son of the father. It says that Barabbas was a robber. It said in other places he was an instituting rebellion, but we want him gone. I always just found this so unfair, and it is unfair. But again, it is a hint to us that we're Barabbas, every single one of us, right? Jesus is taking our place for punishment, and we're being set free. We can say, gosh, that is so unfair. Or Pilate shouldn't have just left it to the winds and should have just decided, right? Jesus, again, is not being killed, but he is giving his life up. This is going to happen, our forgiveness of sins, one way or the other. Judas didn't have to be the one who did it. Pilate doesn't have to be the one who did it. But this is happening one way or another. And that ends John 18. What I'm going to meditate on is how people, in, in, and even a, in a temple or a church structure, can feel like they're doing the right thing or doing things for the right reason and instead are doing the worst thing on the planet. We can convince ourselves that we're doing the right thing. And, and Jesus even said a couple of chapters ago, they will think that they're doing this for God. We go too far in thinking of our own opinions and thinking our way is the right way, is the only way, and then going too far in what we do about it. Boy, that is something to meditate on. And what I'm going to pray about is that I always have that humility to contrast and compare my thoughts, my life, to the Bible and to Jesus. I talked about the plumb line. It shows you the true up and down. I'm always going to measure myself, or I hope to measure myself. I pray to measure myself against that straight up and down. And what I'm going to share with others is that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this earth. When we think about things on this earth, and sometimes we get scared, filled with anxiety, disappointed in how things are going. You know what? Our kingdom is not of this earth either. We are waiting for our time to be in our kingdom with our Lord. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always listen to any of my other podcasts and you can find out about them on abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.